Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I know lunchtime is approaching, so I'll keep that in mind. Um, thank you, Professor, Professor Mignone, Chancellor Emeritus Rotella, for the gracious invitation to be here. I have to say I give this presentation with uh, a heavy heart. Um, I was, as you heard, I was bureau chief in Paris uh, for the Los Angeles Times. I spent a lot of t time in Paris, learned a lot about uh, the issues I'm going to discuss in Paris and have many friends there. So I just want to express my sympathy and solidarity with, uh, with the people of, of France uh, after the events of yesterday. And the presentation I'm going to give, uh, I'm going to stick to the presentation, which obviously I prepared before the events of yesterday. but. Um, Hopefully we'll give some context or some background that might help to understand a little bit the attacks of last night. Uh, Islamic terrorism is, of course, as we've discussed here, the, one of the foremost security issues facing the Mediterranean. It's a time of unprecedented radicalization. Tens of thousands of jihadis are on the move uh, to uh, the Middle East and North Africa from around the world. Security forces are struggling to contain the threat from the Islamic State and the various affiliates and offshoots of Al-Qaeda. And often we see this threat discussed in political discourse or in media coverage as a threat that moves from south to north or, uh, or from east to west, but I think in reality it's far more complex and sometimes the opposite is true. I'm going to discuss this broad threat really in a microcosm, a very specific story, a very specific case, which is the Charlie Hebdo attacks. Not as much the attacks themselves, but as the group of young men, the, the small network that produced the people who carried out those attacks in January. These young men are from a neighborhood in northeast Paris called Bout Chaumont. Uh, they became radicalized in the early 2000s. They were the first Frenchmen to go to uh, fight along al alongside Al-Qaeda uh, in U US occupied Iraq after the invasion. And a decade later, they've gone from rather primitive amateurish jihadis to frontline figures in the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda, those who have survived. Some of them died along the way. And they are wreaking havoc, they have wreaked havoc from Paris to Tunisia, to Yemen, to Syria. And uh, I think, I don't want to speculate or exaggerate, but I think there's a good chance that a couple of the people I'm going to discuss uh, may have played a role in uh, planning the attacks of, of last night. Uh, the, the story of the Bouchamont crew shows that some of the most dangerous terrorists in the world today are born in the West, are born in Europe. They radicalize on European streets and mosques and prisons and, and of course on the internet. They move among Europe and North Africa and the Middle East. Uh, terrorism in the Mediterranean region as many of the other cultural and, and political phenomena we've talked about at this conference is, is a story of cross-fertilization, of, of convergences. Uh, violent people and ideas flow back and forth across the sea with unprecedented speed and power. The grim trajectory of this group shows how terrorism really works and that it's often more anarchic and protean and opportunistic than we may think. And it reveals some of the forces that nurture terrorism today, whether alienation or crime, uh, personal bonds, the overwhelming power of social media, and breakdowns in justice and intelligence. As I said, I, I covered uh, terrorism across Europe and the Muslim world uh, based in Paris. And after the Charlie Hebdo attacks happened this January, I quickly realized when I saw the names of the people involved that I knew a lot about particularly about the Kuwachi brothers, the two brothers who attacked Charlie, the Charlie Hebdo magazine and died after that rampage across Paris. Uh, I, I realized I understood exactly where they came from because I had spent a lot of time uh, covering the group of, of young men that they came from uh, in, in the early 2000s. I had interviewed their friends, their mothers, their girlfriends, uh, the law enforcement professionals who tracked and investigated and prosecuted them. I, uh, their lawyers, I, and, and so I went back to, uh, to France uh, in the spring and, and revisited uh, this story. These were young men, all of them French, born in Paris, mostly of North African origins, very young when they radicalized. The youngest was 14 uh, when, when, when he radicalized, and the leader of the group, the ideologue, was only 23. 
uh, and really had no jihadi credentials other than family relationships to people who had been involved in the Algerian connected jihad uh, in France of the 1990s. Um, and the neighborhood they came from was not the worst neighborhood in Paris. It, it's, it's, if you know Paris, it's near the Bouchemont Park, which is a very beautiful park. Uh, it's an area that has a working class uh, population of Muslim origins, but also a big Jewish community, an Asian community, and a very and a sort of growing Bohemian and, and yuppie community. Um, so obviously deprivation and, and racism and unemployment and some of the other structural factors that are at work produce their radicalization, but I would say it goes beyond that in their case and the case of others. It even goes beyond religion. I think radicalization, uh, there's a lot of studies about this, is really a lot of it is about the power of a culture and the power of the small group. Um, in these areas of France and of London and of Brussels where crime and extremism converge, you have alienated youths who see that they have few options and, and the, 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 the forces in their neighborhoods, the, the things they can aspire to are being a rap artist or a soccer player or a gangster or an extremist. And, and sadly, that's the landscape in which they radicalize. And it's really a culture, I think, a phenomenon, radicalization. Uh, and as we heard uh, from Professor Antonori in those videos would have been fascinating to see that has this culture that is in many ways not unlike street gang culture, but in this case, the street gang is an international army, right? And these people are swept up in this idea that these violent and aimless lives in their minds are now gonna have a noble purpose. Just to give you a profile of a couple of the key figures who will be important later, Peter Sharif, who was one of these young men, was, uh, his father was Catholic from, uh, from a French colony in the Caribbean. His mother was Tunisian, but not at all uh, fundamentalist, in fact, quite secular. Peter Sharif was not raised uh, as a practicing Muslim. He liked uh, American action films and, and, and hung out on the street and was very Western as a teenager. He got involved in crime, as many kids uh, from, his, from those kinds of neighborhoods in his background do, um, and, uh, and drugs, but he also had enough discipline and drive to join the French army, and uh, sadly washed out after an accident. Uh, he wanted to be a paratrooper. He was a very tormented and contradictory guy, as many of these, these uh, extremists are. This was a guy who, as he was radicalizing and was committing anti-Semitic attacks, uh, small attacks, uh, uh, beating people up or, or vandalizing restaurants, Jewish restaurants on the streets of Paris, had a Jewish girlfriend uh, who, did never, who never converted. He knew she was Jewish uh, and they remained, he remained faithful to her even after he went off to Iraq to fight. So it shows you the, the strange uh, impulses that are going on. I did a long interview with her and it was amazing to see uh, how he could somehow compartmentalize in his mind his relationship with a Jewish girlfriend and his, his Islamic extremism. But he became very active in this group and it was he who recruited Sheriff Ku Sharif Kuwachi uh, who went on to, con to carry out the, uh, the Charlie Hebdo attacks this year. And they went along with a group of others to uh, Iraq after the US inv invasion of 2003 which is really what radicalized them and, and went through incredible odysseys. There were a dozen of them, dozen of them in total. Uh, some were killed in action uh, some were maimed, lost eyes and arms. Others were uh, involved in jailbreaks, wounded, uh, but they all ended up coming back uh, or being arrested and sent back and did time in, in jail in, in, in France. Another important figure in this group was named Boubacar El Hakim, uh, who was so radical that when he first got to Baghdad, he actually went on radio and gave interviews on French radio, calling to his friends back in the neighborhood to come to Iraq with him and fight the Americans and go boom in a suicide bombing. And in fact, his, uh, his brother died, was the first Frenchman to die in a suicide bombing in Iraq in 2004. So this group comes back to uh, France. They're all convicted. Um, despite the fact that there was strong evidence that they had taken part with Al-Qaeda in combat uh, and, and been part of a network that had sent people, recruited and sent suicide bombers, they did very little time. Their sentences ranged, the, the, the one who did the most time was Bubarak al-Hakim, he served about seven years. Some of them served only a couple of years. The, the laws is something we'll talk about a little later. Um, uh, against terrorism, the, pr the prison sentences are curiously um, weak in my opinion, and, and that's part of the problem. 
So when they come out of prison in 2011, 2012, the jihadi landscape has shifted dramatically and, and really gotten worse uh, than ever before. The new landscape of jihad was dominated by the rising um, insurgency and the and rising combat in Syria and by the changes that were happening in North Africa, particularly in Libya and other places as a result of the Arab Spring. Boubacar Buba el-Hakim, who's of Tunisian origin, a Frenchman of Tunisian origin, goes to uh, Tunisia and act, it quickly becomes a leader of, of an Al-Qaeda affiliate which is led largely by people who had been imprisoned in Italy and other places, Tunisians, and then come back to Tunisia. He gets involved in gun running from Libya, and in 2013, he participates personally in two um, assassinations of secular political leaders in Tunisia, which greatly shook the very fragile uh, Tunisian uh, political scene. Uh, Boubarak el-Hakim personally carried out those those assassinations from what everyone thinks that I talked to in, 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 in uh, European intelligence and, uh, and in fact put out a video uh, taking credit for it. And then he followed the evolution of the jihadi landscape. Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State were competing there in Tunisia and other places and he made the shift from Al-Qaeda to the Islamic State and he went to Syria where he is now one of the leading French uh, figures in the Islamic State based in Syria and among other things is involved in the recruitment of foreign fighters from Tunisia which is one of the countries that has sent the most uh, foreign fighters to Syria. Uh, some estimates as many as 8,000 and he's considered one of the top Frenchmen who are involved in, 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 in dealing with French and Francophone uh, jihadis when they come to the Islamic State in Syria and that's why the French and the Americans have been trying industriously to kill him in airstrikes and that's why I think there's a potential that he may be one of the people who was involved in plotting uh, this attack last night because I think that attack was definitely carried out by people who knew France and, and Paris very well. The Syria that that uh, and the landscape that Boubacar Halakim went to really is shows the drama of the threat that, that Western and, 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 and services and intelligence services in the Muslim world are dealing with now because radicalization is so much more intense and the volume, the numbers are so much worse than in the past. Uh, when I was in France in 2013, the French were concerned because they had counted 135 uh, Frenchmen who had gone to Syria to fight. When I was there this year, the number was up over 1,400, so a tenfold increase in two years. Uh, Belgium, which is a much smaller country, has one of the highest proportions, up over 400 foreign fighters that have gone to Syria. Uh, there are big clusters going from Spain, particularly from uh, the Spanish enclaves in Morocco and, and Ceuta, uh, obviously from North Africa, Tunisia, as I said. And you have the implications also of the failed state in Libya and the spread of ISIS to, to other areas as we've seen. This jihadi diaspora is also far bigger and worse than in the past because some people call it the easy jet jihad. It is just simply easier to get to Syria and Iraq and fight than it was in the past when people were trying to go to places like Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, it's cheaper, one can fly to Turkey, the, the Turkish security forces for a long time, a lot of people in Europe were complaining to me they weren't doing enough to, to, to monitor and try and prevent that flow. Um, and of course, the power of social media is stronger than ever and this is, what is going on in Syria, what is incredible is how much of it is on social media, how much these young men, when they arrive from Europe, the first thing they do is go up on Twitter and post pictures of themselves with a Kalashnikov, not to mention then disseminating videos and images of the, some of the barbarities they, they participate in. So it's really an incredibly, uh, it's clandestine on the one hand, but open on the other to the point where I was told by French intelligence in, in the spring that, and, and Belgian intelligence, that a directive went out from the Islamic State to some of these foreign fighters to tone down how much they were on, on, on uh, social media because they could be targeted and certainly if they ever wanted to return they were leaving a trail with which they could be prosecuted. Uh, but, the, but in fact some have even posted fake obituaries in order to return, you know, hoping that people would think they were dead, whether they could, to, commit a, to try to commit attacks or because uh, they, they had decided they'd had enough. This is also sadly 
a crazier, more bloodthirsty, more sadistic jihad than, than ever before. I know that's hard to, it's hard to, to compare one thing to another, but if you think about particularly when people went to join Al-Qaeda in Pakistan and Afghanistan, often they went to training camps and they spent a lot of time training and didn't necessarily see combat. Um, what happens in Syria is you have a lot of people going uh, who are hungry for action. You have a lot more people with mental problems, a lot of people who are just criminals who really just see the, 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 the religious part as a veneer. Um, a very sort of telling quote about that is a, a Frenchman who was arrested on his return from Syria when he was being questioned by French intelligence. He said, I'm not interested in Islam, I'm interested in jihad which I think shows a, a slight ignorance of the, 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 some basic concepts. Um, so these, these jihadis now, when they go to Syria and Iraq, they end up, they're much more likely to participate very quickly in combat, in atrocities, in torture, in rape. Uh, they, it, it's much more uh, quick and much more intense and much more dehumanizing, I think. Uh, 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 Superintendent Alain Grignard of the Belgian Federal Police, who's someone I've been talking to for a long time about this, comparing, talking about the mindset of these jihadis when they return, in his case, to Belgium, he said, it's like entering a real life video game when they go to Syria. Real guns, real people, real blood. And you develop a feeling of power like you've never had. You come back to your neighborhood full of that power. You're ready to fight the cops. You're drunk on that power. You're drugged on that violence. So it's very dangerous. This new battleground is also different, and the Islamic State is fundamentally different from Al-Qaeda, because Al-Qaeda used to have, in, particularly in Pakistan and the bin Laden days, a, external operation cell that what it did was train, recruit, and direct attacks in the West. And people would be guided to their targets through communications, and it was all elaborately thought out, and there was a lot of communication back and forth when people went back to do attacks in places like England. Now, the Islamic State is much more opportunistic. The leaders really leave, the, the local Iraqi, Syrian, Middle Eastern leaders, leave a lot of the Western plotting to the jihadis who are there from the foreign countries. So what the French or the Belgians have told me is that the way plots happen, it's much more that a Frenchman comes to a leader of the Islamic State and proposes something, and he says, sure, fine, here's some money, go do it. You know, it's much more uh, opportunistic, much less structured. And of course, as we've seen in many attacks, often there isn't that kind of planning at all. There are just directives sent out and people spontaneously in the West, uh, based purely on contact with social media, go out and do attacks following directives. One French, um, senior French counterterrorism official described it to me, he said, uh, uh, it's open bar jihad. Do what you want, where you want, when you want, and how you want. And that makes it incredibly difficult to stop, along with the sheer volume of people that have to be watched. That makes it incredibly difficult to stop. Um, that brings us to the Charlie Hebdo case, uh, which the genesis of that attack is that Peter Sharif, the young man who had the Jewish girlfriend I mentioned to you, uh, when he's let out on bail before his trial, he flees France and goes to Yemen in 2011. And in Yemen, he was one of the few Frenchmen who met, made contact with Al-Qaeda in Yemen. People go from many places have gone to Yemen, but few Frenchmen. But he went and joined Al-Qaeda in Yemen. And he made contact with that group. And because he was there, uh, Sharif Kouachi, another member of this group who had gotten out of prison, and a man named Salim Bengalem, a uh, convicted murderer who had radicalized in prison because he'd met these veterans of Iraq in French prison. They went to Yemen and met with him, with, with Peter Sharif, and perhaps with other people in Al-Qaeda in Yemen, but definitely with their fellow Frenchman, Peter Sharif. Sharif Kouachi was given brief training. There was some discussion of, a, of an attack, of different kinds of attacks. Uh, there was some discussion of Charlie Hebdo, but it wasn't, from what I understand, or what the French have been able to determine, it ver not very spelled out. Uh, he may have been provided with, with some money. There's some figures uh, as high as $20,000. But that was really the seed of the Charlie Hebdo attack. Uh, Kawachi comes back to France, joins up with his brother, joins up with uh, another guy who had met the group in, um, in prison, Amedi Koulibaly, and they carry out those attacks that all of you saw, which target the Charlie Hebdo magazine and uh, a Jewish grocery and a, and a French policewoman. Uh, the the Kouachi brothers attack Charlie Hebdo, 
uh, Kolobeli attacks uh, the, the, the Jewish grocery. Now, you may have noticed, and a lot of intelligence professionals were very mystified by the Charlie Hebdo attacks because essentially two groups took credit, if you remember. Al-Qaeda in Yemen took credit for the Charlie Hebdo attack, but distanced itself from the attack on the French grocery. And Ahmadi Koulibaly, who had never been to Syria, uh, uh, claimed his attack in the name of the Islamic State, which seems strange because those groups are really rivals. But the fact is, the reason that happened is because what was important to these young men was their small group that had formed in the neighborhoods and in the prisons. That was really the driving factor, and it, and it shows you how there's a mix going on here. It's not necessarily big time masterminds back in foreign countries calling the shots as much as these guys who have these bonds where things like the logic of one group being a rival of the other do doesn't necessarily um, factor in uh, because these guys clearly coordinated these attacks. There's no doubt about it. And there, is some, there were some recent indications in, in, in recent weeks that there may have been some communication from a, from a French speaker in Syria to Ahmedi Koulibaly connected to the Islamic State. And certainly, I don't know the, we'll see what comes out today and the coming days about the attacks of last night, but it, it's interesting to note that in recent um, m weeks and months, the French, in, in, in concert with, with U.S. intelligence, were trying very aggressively to take out some of the top Frenchmen with the Islamic State in Syria, including uh, Salim Ben Ghalem and, and including Boubacar El Hakim, the young men I've described to you, because of the fear that they were the ones meeting, recruiting, grooming, and sending back Frenchmen to commit attacks. So that's why there's this possibility that that's really that the, 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 where, the, where, the, where this plot may have emanated from. And um, what, what is striking, however, and what I think really shows the, the urgency and the severity of the threat is that the, the French law enforcement is generally very good at detecting networks and at infiltrating them and at monitoring them. And the, the size of this attack and the number of people who are able, who are able to participate and catch the authorities off guard is, is really surprising and, and, and tragic. Um, just a couple of points on what some potential responses or solutions that I think are important. Um, I think one thing, and having covered this for a long time in different places, that is becoming more important than ever is, is good, aggressive analysis, sophisticated analysis, and not just collection of intelligence. One of the problems is that as the, the U.S. has always had this problem because it, it uses so much technical intelligence, and the Europeans, after, uh, as they're having to watch more and more people, they just can't keep up with all these people. There's so much information that's being gathered that it becomes somewhat useless because the, the services are drowning in intelligence, so analysis is, al is always key, emphasizing that. And I think there's another simple but dramatically lacking solution um, that, I, that I think that at least all the law enforcement officials I talked to in Europe have complained to me about and said they wish more was being done on, and that's prison sentences. As I mentioned, prison sentences are remarkably short unless you're caught in the act of violence for terrorism in Europe. Um, a lot of these guys in the, in the Butchermont network uh, as I said, only though they'd been convicted of going off to fight in, uh, overseas, only did uh, three to seven years. Uh, I ask, I talk more and more to law enforcement officials who tell me they're arresting people who have already been convicted of terrorism in the past, in the 90s or in the early 2000s, and have gotten out. So they're dealing with second and third generations. I think particularly with the savagery and the violence and the, the volume of the, this new jihad in Syria and Iraq, there's going to need to be, I think, tougher, longer sentences for people who are convicted so you can take them off the street for 15, 20 years. I'm not talking about, as some of my French interlocutors said, creating a French Guantanamo. I'm talking about when there's strong evidence and the justice system and the intelligence system has done its job and built a case against someone. It seems counterproductive for them after all that time to only serve five years and come back out, as in the case of these young men, where prison only served to radicalize them more and they came right back out and joined the fray. So um, I, uh, I'm happy to have been uh, part of this, cent this uh, conference uh, from the journalistic perspective, and uh, thank you very much.